Good afternoon, guys. What an honor to close a conference. The very last speech at, oh, what time do we have? Four o'clock. All right, I've got a couple of simple, simple aims. One, I hope nobody falls asleep. Two, I hope as many of you stay as, as long as you can. And three, that you don't stay on your phones the entire time. Uh, <laughs> that's my main thing. And four, although that's probably number one, I'd like to open your mind and hopefully you, you learn a couple of things from, uh, from my major leadership, leadership failure. Uh, my name is David Ostenga, and I'm going to be talking about hopefully something a little bit different. Uh, very often, um, I've been to many conferences where somebody gets up and tells everybody how wonderful they are, what great projects they've done, and I kind of start thinking, wow, I've had a lot of uh, failures in my life, and I start thinking I'm very, very small and not good. So I want to share a failure that I, that I had in my life, um, uh, which hopefully, hopefully will, will teach all of us uh, a few things. Um, so uh, here we go, a couple of things. Um, maybe we'll start off with who I am, because that's kind of important so that you understand why I'm even here, why I'm standing in front of you. Um, Bob the Builder. I kind of feel like I'm Bob the Builder because it's, it's what I've been doing. Um, I've been working at these companies, um, and it seems to be a bit of, a, bit of an MO, something that I, that I do. Um, EPAM was, uh, I was the very first employee of EPAM in Poland. I built that whole thing. So all of you that work at EPAM, you can call me daddy, yes. Um, uh, that was the, the very first, first company I started um, uh, here in Poland. I set up SolarWinds as well. I was one of the very first employees uh, at SolarWinds here in, here in Krakow. Uh, at IBM, I did a major project for them, the biggest IT project that, that IBM had. Um, then I had the, uh, the interesting experience of working on, on Alexa with, uh, with Amazon uh, up in Gdańsk. Uh, very interesting company, uh, Amazon. Um, and now I'm with uh, Shell Energy, um, which is a, a, a small company that um, uh, a smallish company, co well, compared to Shell, that, that Shell bought a few years ago, we sell energy in the, in the UK. So as you can see, quite, and a few other companies in between, so as you can see, quite a broad, broad experience, both large corporations, smaller corporations, um, but technology has been kind of throughout my, my life. But the most important thing is I've been sort of building, building teams, building companies, uh, building cultures, that's, that's something that's been, that's been, uh, has been my thing. Um, and that's why I'm here talking to you. But today, a little bit different. I'm not going to talk about sort of, I guess, my work. I'm going to talk to you about Krakow Kings. Krakow Football Kings, uh, an American football team uh, here in Krakow. Uh, now, before you turn off and think, oh, I didn't come here for a lecture about sport, I'm going to show you some of the things that happen in sport and how significant they are and how many things they taught me in, uh, in business and the failure that I had as a, as a sports coach and how um, we can use that in, in business to make sure we don't, we don't have such failures. Um, so let's get started. It really is, it's true. There is a, an American football team in Krakow. There is an entire league in Poland. All the major cities here in, uh, in Poland have teams. Um, yes, it's the, it's the sport with the shoulder pads and, and the helmets. And as you can see from that picture, I'm quite small. Um, I used to play uh, when, I was, when I was younger, but um, these guys are quite, quite big, and we have a, a huge mix of, um, uh, of different types of, of body types, which brings different personalities to the team. And here's the first analogy that we have with business. In, in the workplace, especially when you think about an agile team, you have different types of people in that team. You have different skill sets in that team. Um, uh, and that's something that's, that's very cool about American football. We have different skill sets that do different things that combine together in order to, to, uh, uh, to achieve a, a common goal. When you look at a picture, as you can see here, um, there's, there's different sizes. It's not all cookie cutters, not all the same, the same sizes. And that brings with it different personalities and different approaches. Um, so how did I come about being a coach uh, of a team here in Krakow? Um, well, there used to be, a, uh, there used to be uh, two teams before. Uh, in Krakow, and they merged together and decided to form the, the Krakow, uh, Krakow Kings, and they came to me and asked me to be, to be their head coach. Um, so my first question was, why? What, what do you want? Ah, oh, well, we want to win. I said, do you really? I um, said, yes, we want to win. So I said, well, in that case, um, I'll come and join the team. I'll be your head coach, but on, on one proviso. And the very first thing I did is I, um, I did some uh, uh, physical tests for them to, to check whether they're in... Uh, great condition whether they actually come, come prepared. And the funny story is in the very first year that I came, they weren't prepared. So I walked off. It was actually quite a funny story because I, I came to, to the practice, I did the, uh, the test that I, they asked them to do and because I said to them, 80% of the players have to pass these physical tests and if they do, then I'll, be, I'll become head coach. 
Um, only about 50% of the players passed. Um, so I went, okay. And I started walking off. And there's this silence. And all I can hear is one of the players saying to the other one, I told you. I told you he wasn't joking. Um, so they had somebody else coaching the first year. And then in the second year, they called me again and said, look, can you, can you come and, come and be, be a coach? I said, same rules. If you want to win, you have to prepare physically. If you pass these tests, then I'll become your head coach. This time was completely different. 95% of the players passed. It was really awesome. Um, so I said, right, we'll do this. And the very first practice, I stood in front of the players, and this is an important, important thing. I said, if you do exactly what I tell you, if you follow my instructions, we will win a championship within the first three years. But you have to do what I tell you and follow me and listen to, to my instructions. Okay? So for those of you that have been through um, any kind of leadership training or, or management training, you'll recognize straight away that there's a type of leadership style. It's an authoritarian style. Okay? When you say, do what I tell you, and there will be a success. So that's the way I decided to, to run the team, because that's what I felt the team needed. They needed to understand, they needed somebody that has won a championship. I've won multiple championships as a player. I have three national championships as a, as a player. Um, I have, so I wanted to show them and build a particular culture. So we did. And we won a championship. Uh, in our second year, we, we, won a, we won a national championship. So everything was great. Everything's fabulous. I'm standing here telling you how wonderful I am, right? Well, now time for the, for the leadership failure. This is the table the following year after we won a championship. Yeah, you start at the top and start looking, looking, where are the kings? Where are the kings? We don't see them. They're a championship team, right? They're great. Yeah, let's look at it. Fourth, first from the bottom. Okay, as you can see, in eight games, we won three and lost five games. We nearly got relegated to the second division. Same team. We didn't lose any players. We didn't have any major, uh, major injuries. Okay, the opposition always wants to play a little bit better when they're playing against the champion. That, that always happens, fair enough. But not enough to lose this many games. And to be honest, we were lucky. To, two of those games were against Titania Lublin, who were <laughs> the one team that didn't win any games. So we only won one other game, and we were kind of lucky to, to win that one. So what happened? Well, me happened. And that was the problem. What I didn't do is I didn't analyze why we won, how we won. This is what the season felt like. This is the entire season felt hard, felt tough, felt like we, we, were, we were struggling. There was no energy that we had before. Why? I mean, we had a championship. The guys were still motivated to win. What did we do wrong? And this was the major failure that I did. I didn't analyze why we won. I didn't look. Very often, now th let's think about when we do a retrospective, okay? Usually we look at some of the things we like to improve. Yes, we, we, we sometimes mention some of the things we like to keep, but we very often focus on the things that we'd like to improve. Whenever we have a project of any type at work, when we have the delivery, uh, when we deliver a sprint or, or anything else, we look at you know, what could have been, what could have been better. Um, sometimes we even get forced into celebrating a delivery, but we just go out for a beer or, or whatever and we celebrate the delivery, it went well, but we don't sit down and say, well, why did it go well? Okay, we say, well, it went well, it's supposed to, and that's it. And that was the fundamental problem. Now, more or less I knew why, why we won, um, but what I didn't do is I didn't understand that I needed to look in the mirror and see, do I need to change the way these, this team is run or do we keep it? Evidently, I needed to change the way this team is run because from a championship team, we went, we went to a very, very poor team. Now, why did that happen? The reason that happened is because in the, fir in the first two years, when I said to the team, follow me, do as I, as I tell you, that was enough to bring us to a particular level. However, to take the next step, the burden of responsibility and of leadership needed to be passed from me onto other people. It needed to be passed onto captains, onto the other coaches in my staff, and onto, onto senior players. They needed to take on the responsibility in order to, in order to drive this forward. Okay? And those of you that have ever gone from working in a, uh, in a waterfall system to an agile system will know that very well. In a waterfall system, you very often you have a project manager, you have a team lead, whoever, that tells you, you do this, you do this, you do this. But in an agile team, it's completely different. 
Nobody's going to tell you what to do. You need to take the responsibility onto yourself and say, All right, that's the item I'm going to do because of X and Y. That's the right thing to do today. Well, that's what I didn't do. I didn't push the burden onto the team. And I, wasn't, I was no longer enough. We needed to go a step higher, but me alone. Now, keep in mind, there's, uh, it would be a lot easier if it was a scrum team because I would only have eight people to run. This is seven coaches, um, uh, 45 players, plus, you know, um, support staff, medical staff. So this is an organization. You know, when we travel, we have a 60-seater bus. There is no space on that bus when we travel to away games. So it needed more. Now, this picture here, it looks awesome, right? It looks like these are, these are captains. You know, American football team usually has four captains. And before the game, they walk into the field for the towing course. This looks like real unity, doesn't it? These huge, big guys, you know, holding hands and walking as a team together onto the field. Awesome, inspirational. This is probably the most painful picture that I have from my, from my time as a, as a coach of that team. Because that picture shows me that these captains were only there for that, for the coin toss. I didn't use them for anything else. I didn't empower them to do anything else. Their main job was to walk into the field and do the coin toss. Now, if we have captains, shouldn't they have more roles? Shouldn't they have the more responsibilities? Shouldn't they be doing something? I should have ceded a lot of my responsibility to them so that they can run a team. Even from a logistical point of view, four people versus me, it's a lot easier. If these four guys can take on some of the things uh, in order to, to move things forward, it would have made things a lot easier. But I didn't do that. I kept that authoritarian style. I didn't step back and allow these people to work, um, to become leaders. And that was my mistake. So what did I do? Uh, how, do we, how do we change this? Well, the first thing was I looked in the mirror. Uh, and I said, right, I'm doing something wrong. Oh, before that, I'll, um, I'll let you in on to another, another story. Because we did, um, I didn't see some of, the, um, uh, some of the signs early on. After every year, I, I do a, a survey. I ask an anonymous survey, and I ask all the players their opinions. How did the season go? Um, could we have done something better? Could we improve things? What did you think of the season personally? What did you think of the coaches and so on? Now, after the championship season, oh, that's the greatest survey I've ever, ever read about myself. It was awesome. I mean, listen, I, I took a copy, I sent it to my mum. said, mum, check out what a brilliant coach I am. It was just, it was fabulous. It, uh, to this day, I remember how, how awesome things were. I mean, everything was great because winning hides everything. Winning hides all problems. Delivery, good, a good delivery will hide all problems. Okay, any issues that you had within the team, if you deliver a successful thing and everybody is CEO and everybody is happy, client is happy, those things get kind of masked. After this season, when we, when we had a, a tough season, we did exactly the same survey, exactly the same, the same questions. Ooh. To this day, I don't necessarily remember the words that the players used, but I have never been kicked in the face so much by somebody, which I just remember the feeling uh, of complete and utter pain that I've given so much to these players and yet they blame me for everything. I was the reason why we had a bad season. They didn't quite understand why, but you know, it was me, it was my fault, which is fine, I understand. You know, players win games, coaches lose games. Okay, fair enough, but that was, and, and, and it showed the very positive thing in, in, in the survey when they filled it in, it showed the passion that they still wanted to win. They were just angry that they weren't winning and they didn't fully understand why they, they, weren't, they weren't winning. Um, so I looked at that and I started thinking, well, first of all, my first reaction was I'm done. I wanted to walk away because it was so painful reading these things. Uh, but then I thought, no, this is, this we need to fix, this we can fix. So I took a couple of steps. Um, first of all, I, I sat down with my coaches and I gave them a lot more responsibility, a lot more. I started stepping back and I gave a lot more responsibility to the other coaches. Like I said, there's seven coaches in, in the coaching staff. Um, by the way, this sounds like this, uh, this costs a lot of money, doesn't it? Yeah, this is all free. We do this completely for free. We're, we're an amateur organization, nobody gets paid. Um, so I sat down with the coach and I gave him a, a lot more responsibility. I started, I started uh, backing away. The other thing, I started giving responsibility to, to the captains. Then I set up also which I, uh, something I called um, a, a sort of a, a leadership academy where we took players that we thought had leadership potential 
um, and did some sessions with them in order to give them some tools, make them understand what it is to be a leader, what, what it takes. To, it takes to be a leader and the kind of things that they should be doing with the team. Um, what was important is that we didn't, the players that were selected for this, we didn't announce this to the rest of the team because we didn't want a situation where oh, you, you and you, you come and be in a leadership team because then straight away that um, kind of makes them leaders and that wasn't the point. The point was we wanted to give them some tools, educate them what they should be doing, but they have to themselves then implement those tools in order to, to be those leaders and, and be recognized by, by, the other, by the other players. The other thing I tried to do is to, is to create an atmosphere where the players took responsibility on themselves and understood that it's no longer me. It's no longer do what the coach tells you in your Wooden Championship. It's more what do I need to do in order to, um, to win a championship. Um, and there was a very cool, unexpected thing that happened. Um, I wanted to, uh, the coaches to get a little bit more involved in monitoring the players when they went to the gym to work out, to lift weights. So, um, because logistically it's a bit difficult to know where the players go to which gym because they go to different gyms all over Krakow. So I said, look, can we put together an Excel spreadsheet and just and ask the players to put in, into the Excel spreadsheet when they're going to be in the gym so that a player, a sort of a coach can pop in and, and see how they're doing a really cool thing happened. Suddenly, these captains and suddenly the leaders started saying, why, why isn't your name on the sheet? Why aren't you working out? The players themselves started putting pressure on each other in order to go to the gym. And it wasn't just me saying, you should be going to the gym, you should be working out. The players themselves started noticing that, hey, you're not going to the gym, you're not going to the gym, why not? Let's do this together. So, so that started, um, started that, that ball moving, moving forward. And then this. This is, uh, all my players uh, always laugh because uh, I always use this at conferences, this is my favorite picture. Um, but the reason for this picture is because it says something. There's a whole story behind this picture and it's very important as to what this, this signifies. Um, like I said to you before, I said, follow me, whatever I do, um, whatever I tell you to do, we will, win the we will win the championship. So there wasn't a space for the players in order to lead others and to help others. And this guy here without the helmet, um, his name is Darek, he's a, he's a wide receiver. Basically, he, he catches passes. We throw the ball to him and he, and he catches it. A little bit more difficult than it sounds, trust me. Um, now, the problem he had, if he dropped the very first pass in the game, forget it. We, we, could, we could forget him. For the rest of the game, he wouldn't catch anymore. He would be unreliable. And that's one tool out of our sort of toolbox that we would lose and we have to throw the ball to other players. And he was a very, very, very good player. Um, in practice, he was great. In practice, he would catch everything. And I tried everything. I tried motivating him. I tried talking to him. I tried um, sitting down with him. I tried shouting at him. I tried punishing him. I tried everything. I mean, I've been a coach for many years. I've won many championships. You'd think I'd find a way to get through to this player. I couldn't. And before one of the games, one of the players came to me and said, can I, because all the, all, all the guys knew this. They knew if he doesn't catch the first ball in, in the game, then he's, he's done for. So one of the leaders came to me and said, can I take Derek to the side and talk to him before the game? I said, absolutely, because this is exactly what I want. I want guys to take those leadership um, moments and, and, uh, and do that. So he, he did, he, he took him to the side and literally we, our practice field was, like 50, 50 meters away. So he went over to the, took him to the practice field and it was just the two of them and he threw him a pass and he caught it, threw him another one and he caught it. And he said, look, you do this here in the practice field perfectly. You've got no issues catching the ball. What's the difference between here, this bit of grass here and that bit of grass 50 meters over there? You can do this. Um, and it worked. He came onto the field, caught that first pass, Ever since that game, this player has never had trouble catching balls in, game, in any games. That mental thing, something happened during that conversation from one of his peers that changed the way he approached games, played in games. We no longer had to worry. Even if he dropped that first pass in the game, it no longer mattered. He would, he would carry on and be, be productive for the rest of the game. All down from this conversation. And, all, and this conversation only happened because I allowed it to happen, because I created the environment, which before I was blocking, before by being an authoritarian leader, there was no space for that. This conversation would have never happened. This would have, would have been blocked because it would have been my responsibility to do. 
But once I stepped back and changed the way, the way I was leading, it allowed the players and other, and other leaders to, um, to step in. And this is the result. Uh, okay, not a trophy, we just got to the final. We happened to lose in the final, but we got back into the final. With exactly the same team, no real additions to the team, no real changes, just in a way I led the team and in a way the team led itself almost, we went back to the championship level, okay? So what can we learn from this? Um, the key takeaways from this are scale the agile retrospective. Now what, I mean, what do I mean by that? Let's not keep the retrospective just to deliveries of sprints. Let's make it bigger. Let's take it further, okay? Let's, take, let's do a retrospective about an entire project, about the entire product. Anytime you deliver anything, anytime you uh, finish a project, do a full retrospective, but don't just focus on what could have been improved. Understand why things worked. Understand why it's a, uh, what did you do in order to be successful? Uh, there was an incident uh, recently in, in, and I won't mention which company it was at, um, that I was working where uh, there's a thing called Trustpilot in, uh, in England, which uh, it's kind of like an opinion about how, how your company does. If you, if you have a lot of customers, if you're a B2C company, then uh, uh, your customers can put opinions about your company on, on Trustpilot. So what happened is we, uh, we went from a particular score, I think from like 2.8 up, up to a 3, which is a very significant milestone. We were very happy at the company. Uh, that it happened, and in our technology department, we're all, hooray, this is fabulous. You see, we put in the technology, we put in these tools, and suddenly our customers are happy, and we've gone up to a, um, we've gone up to a two points, clearly, you know, we're awesome. I went to our head of customer service, and I went, do you know what happened? Because we in the technology department don't have direct contact with our customers. But you do, your agents do, they speak to the customers. Have we done anything different in order to get the score up? He goes, yeah, absolutely. For the last three months, we've been proactive in asking people for opinions on Trustpilot. Nothing to do with us in technology. Nothing to do with what we implemented, the great job that we did. It was all the agents simply saying, hey, you had a great time. Uh, I was able to help you. Would you mind logging into Trustpilot and just giving, leaving your opinion? And that simply drove our score up two points. So look what, now suddenly that retrospective would have been fabulous. All the technology we implemented was great, but we didn't really ask, didn't delve deep into why this was a success. So remember, even when you have a success, when you have a great delivery, understand why. Do scale the agile retrospective and use the retrospective everywhere you can. Understand how you, you achieved your success, okay? It's, it, it doesn't happen by accident. It's by the hard work of your people, okay? Even if something felt really easy, you know, if this delivery was easy, we didn't really have to work hard, that's because you're probably very experienced at what you do. It's probably because you've really gotten everything, all your ducks in a row, and it works really, really well, but still need to understand what happened in order that you can replicate it. Because the worst thing that you can do is go into another sprint or into another project and cut out the things that actually worked because you didn't realize that that's what made it a success, okay? And then lastly, look in the mirror. And that's probably the toughest thing to do is to look what you did and do you need to change? Um, right now, talking about it is very simple. Yeah, I was an authoritarian leader, then I changed and, and, and became a lot more collaborative leader and allowed other people in my organization to lead. It's very easy to say that now. It was a lot more difficult to do. Even more difficult it was to accept that I needed to do things differently. And trust me, I, I like things done in that particular way. <laughs> it's a lot simpler, A, B, C, and that's it. You know, having that conversation, allowing other people to control things, it is very, very difficult. It is very difficult to do, but you need to look in the mirror. Look at yourself first, see, am I being a success? Am I doing this right? Very cool presentation for those of you guys that have been upstairs about code reviews, right? Uh, about how you speak to somebody in the code review, how you say things to that person, how it can make a gigantic difference. You know, he made a very cool comment. He said, mm, towards the end of the day, I tend to be grumpy. Yeah, it's true. 
Okay, towards the end of the day, you're kind of grumpy, you're kind of tired, you had enough. Come on, can we just finish this and move on? Okay, look, you just did this wrong, you're, you're crap, right? Don't, we, we, we need to, it's a lot easier sometimes to be, to be, to be like that. Uh, a funny story, when I was listening to that conversation upstairs, that presentation, it reminded me when I was working with one of my product owners, uh, an enterprise architect, who wrote really excellent um, reports, really good requirements engineer, engineer um, and he brought a, we were doing this large project, he, he finished the report, we gave him the draft of the first report, and he said for me to go over it. So yeah, I went over it, um, you know, made all the markings in, in a document and, and gave it back to him, we did it sort of old school, we did it on paper, um, and he's all pissed off. I'm thinking, I mean, I know this guy, I've known this guy for years, we work really, really well, why is he so angry with me? Um, it's only I realized a little bit later on when somebody else pointed out to me, I used a red pen. That silly. He felt like he was at school. He was really annoyed. He, he opened this document, this beautiful thing that he's been working on for the last three months, and his red markings all over it. It was like, just, just like being at school. It never even occurred to me. The only reason I used the red pen is because I figured it would just be easy to see. And that's why teachers use it. From that point, I learned never ever use a red pen to mark somebody's work. Grab the green pen or a blue pen, and next time I did it, completely different, a different thing. So, little things like that, but always look in the mirror. Why something went well? What's the cause uh, and effect of, uh, of, of all you did? It's that simple. It's that quick. Okay? Scale the agile retrospective so that you learn from your successes, learn why it, was, why it went well, so that you can repeat those successes. Obviously, yes, still look at, look at failures and, and get rid of those, but understand why you, why you did well. Um, and then look in the mirror. Always look in the mirror. It is that simple. I hope that opened your mind a little bit. Uh, I hope that you'll, uh, uh, you'll learn from this and use it. So if you have any questions, just fire away. Um, and I'm, I'm all ears. Any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, the question, for those of you that didn't hear it, uh, the question was that after that first season, um, why should I look at the leadership style? It worked, so why should I change it? Why should I look at it? Because presuming that you know and doing exactly the same thing is very dangerous. Because you, I didn't fully analyze why this worked, and I didn't analyze, is it going to work again? I, I read that beautiful survey that the players gave me, and I thought, I am the greatest coach ever. I don't need to change a thing. I just carry on doing exactly the same thing. I, I, sh I should have looked at it. I should have really thought, why, why was there success, and what do we need to do different in order to, to, to be even better? You cannot do the same thing and expect different, re different results. That's the definition of insanity, okay? So... <laughs> Here, I expected even better results, you know, because I wanted to repeat the championship. Repeating championship is always better. I should have looked at why, why did we get there, and do I need to change anything? Uh, and if I really, truly looked at it, I would have realized that I needed to tweak some things and do things a little bit differently. Yep. Yeah, the question was, how do you, in a successful situation, uh, how do the guys not become biased and just basically think, well, we won, we just need to do the same thing. How do you motivate them? How do you get them to do things differently? First of all, it's a conversation. First of all, it's making them understand that we have gotten to here, and if we carry on doing exactly the same thing, we will essentially move backwards because everybody else is going to move, move up, everybody else is going to be better, we need to do something better, we need to do something more, we need to do something, something different in order to be better. Simply repeating the same thing does not move you forward. It will, it will essentially move you backwards. And to be honest, most of you know this very, very well. The paranoia amongst programmers about not using the latest technology is huge. 
I mean, how often have I, have I heard, um, no, I don't want to work on this project, this uses an old technology. If I stay on this project another six months, I'm going to be behind and uh, you know, this, these frameworks are outdated. No, 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 I've got to use the latest technology. You, you all have that paranoia. And, and it's, it's kind of true. It is, because technology moves so fast that if you don't, you don't keep up with it, you will fall behind. Okay? So it's the same thing in sports and the same thing in pretty much anything that you do in business. You have to keep evolving, you have to keep changing in order to move forward. Um, uh, I mean, look at all the, all the great companies that have completely changed. IBM is a very cool example, all right? IBM, international business machines, don't sell machines. It's a, it's a tech company that's been around for 100 years. They no longer sell machines, haven't sold machines. It's in the name, but they haven't sold machines for a very long time. They've evolved into something else. They realize they can't stand still in this particular aspect, and they've evolved into, into doing something else. Any other questions? Um, if I understood the question, shouldn't, develop, shouldn't the, the big companies listen to developers more? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It is that simple. But here's the problem. You speak the wrong language. It, you, seriously, you do. I mean, think about this. Um, if, you, if you go to a budget owner, right? Your, let's say your, your, your project, uh, project owner or your CEO or whatever, and say, listen, we want to change the way we work. We want to move into Agile. We work in Waterfall right now, we want to move into Agile, it's going to be better, we're going to be able to deliver, deliver much better, it's going to be, uh, the code quality is going to be better, we're going to collaborate a lot more. What's that person going to say? Um, is it going to save me money? Are you going to deliver quicker? Because that's what I care about, that's what I'm measured on. I don't care, frankly, I know they're not going to say this, but they frankly don't care how well you work together. This project will take 10, 10 weeks, can you deliver in eight? Now you can talk. So imagine you go to that same person and say, listen, we want to change the way we work. We want to move into Agile. We will cut 20% off the time of every single project from now on, and we will be able to deliver a $10,000 saving per day. Ooh, sit down, tell me more. This sounds interesting, okay? So you need to make sure you speak the right language. Yes, you're absolutely right. You're, you're the closest to, to the ground, you need to find a way to, to, to get through, but you need to use the right language so that the, the people care, care about it. Um, one of the big things with my, with my team, I, I'll say this to you guys, there's one player here, so maybe he won't tell this to anybody. Um, I frankly don't care about wins and losses. That's not why I do this. The reason why I'm a coach of this team is to, is to help develop better people, okay? That's my goal. I want each of them to be a better person a better um, citizen of, of this country, and that's why I do this. The res and if we do that, the wins, the wins are a byproduct. They happen, they happen to, uh, um, they will happen. They will happen to what, if we do all the things correctly, the wins will come. If I went to that team and said, I'm here because I want you guys to be better citizens. I really want you to be better people. Yeah, that's gonna work. How many of those players are gonna say, yeah, I wanna be a better person. Yeah, right. I want to win championships. I want to medal. I want to, I want to beat the opposition. Okay? So it's speaking the right language. It's, it's, I talk to them about winning, about the championship, about having that glory forever. Um, and then I use other tools in order to, to make them better, better people. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, um, so the question was how do, we, um, 
How do we not become biased of, uh, if this is a success? Why bother even looking at it, right? Yeah, um, I'm sure, and, and this, this happens in, in the big corporations all the time, they keep telling you, if you don't measure something, okay, you can't change it, okay? Um, and it's true, if you, if you don't measure the success, if you don't measure why that success happened, you cannot repeat it, and that's the most important thing. It is, trust me, success hides all problems. Um, I am, from now on, I am very paranoid. Anytime I have a success, um, I kind of step back and say, okay, well, let me really analyze why and let me see if there are any problems, you know, because I don't want there to be underlying hidden things that I missed, because trust me, success completely wipes out. We had no, there was no players in our team that didn't like each other. Everybody loved each other. Suddenly when we started losing games, suddenly I can see conflicts. Suddenly people are, are arguing at practice, which never happened before, okay? So when, when there is success, even more so, I'm driven now to looking at why is the success, what things are making this good, and what things do I need to keep, and literally write them down. Okay, the re I have a, a daily stand-up, or I have a daily huddle, or I have a, um, I don't know, a, a two by two by two, you know, every, every, right now because uh, things are a little bit different online, um, one of the things I've asked my team is to send me two by two by two every week. Two things that went well, two things that they could improve, two things that keep them, uh, keep them up at night, okay? Because right now I can't see them. They're working at home. So they can't even, uh, I can't see those small successes. So this way they get to send me two little successes, two little things that didn't go well and two things that, they, that they're worried about so that I, that I can see them. Because again, I could be completely blinded to the fact that they're sitting at home so everything must be great. They're not complaining. Well, the reason why they're not complaining is because they're depressed. They're sitting at home. They've got nobody to talk to. They're in a small, small flat, and, and I, I need to find a way to see, are they just thinking that everything's okay because we're delivering, and masking the fact that they're actually having a really tough time working from home. So always, always looking at why, why, why? Almost to a paranoid point of view right now. <laughs> I'm kind of worried about it, okay? But listen, don't, don't start thinking that now you need to question yourself. Anytime you deliver something, you think, oh, this, you know, this will never repeat this. No, you will repeat it, but just understand why. That's the, that's the key thing. Okay. Any other questions? Would the team have, have won regardless of me? Mm-hmm. I can't hear you probably. The team would have won anyway? A little bit louder. Um, I'm not sure that they would have um, because I don't think there, was a, there wasn't a culture of winning in the team. Um, and um, I, I, this sounds a little bit derogatory, but um, I kind of call it, it was a Facebook team. Uh, players were there because they wanted to put a picture of face, uh, on Facebook that they played this exotic sport called American football. And that was enough for them. Um, I, and I said to them very clearly, that's not, that's not me. Um, you know, I'm here to win. Um, if, if I will be, I will give you all my time, all my devotion, all my experience, but I'm not here to, to be on a Facebook team. I want, I want a medal, I want a championship. And it's not really a medal for me, because I, like I said, I've, I've, I've gone all those, all those championships. For me, I want to see them be a success. Trust me, there's nothing more rewarding than seeing, than motivating other people to win, to win, to win a championship, other people to deliver. Um, when, you're, uh, when you're a scrum master, when you've, when you've managed to, to get a particular culture in that team, because a scrum master very often is involved in getting that culture, when you can just sit back and watch the team work, it is the most beautiful thing ever when you don't have to do a single thing. That means you've, you're doing your job well. Okay, um, yeah. Any other questions? All right, oh, go ahead.
Yes, so a very interesting point. What makes me think that changing my leadership style was the reason why there was a success? Maybe simply because they lost in that second year, they got motivation in order to, to come back. Uh, if that was the case, they would have improved halfway through the season. Okay? There was time during the season to do something different. There was time to motivate yourself, to change things and to work differently, to, to, um, to change your work ethic in practice. Um, and that's the, the great thing about being a coach. Sometimes I, I think to myself, how the hell does a coach pick a player from, you know, he's got X amount of players. How does he know which one to put it on the field? It is so obvious when you, when you go to practice. You know, when you, when you spend time with them, when you see how they practice, you know straight away which player should be on the field and which player needs to sit on a bench. If losing these games, they saw the trend and they would have changed, they would have improved towards, towards, towards the, the back end of the season. The, the improvement wasn't there is because there was no space for them to do that. There was no, there was no, um, uh, it was too heavy for me to lift. I couldn't lift it on my own. Um, once they started lifting it, that's when it worked. So, uh, so I can see, uh, I, like I said, if, if just losing would have, would, have, would have changed, it would have happened a lot earlier. In fact, it would, things would have started happening after the first game because we went into the first game not expecting to lose. So the first game we thought, all right, yeah, that's just accident, happens sometimes, right? Second game, we'll win, mm, got worse. Third game, we lost again, okay? So by that time, they knew that this, this isn't, these aren't accidents. This is a trend, this is where we are, what can we do? Um, and even then, I should have realized at that point that I needed to change something, but I didn't. Um, I was too set in my ways. Um, I was too much, much, much too rigid. Um, which is something I quite often say to people um, in Agile. Sometimes the people that shout the loudest about Agile are the least Agile people, okay? Because Agile is not about the Agile framework. That, those are just, that's just a set of tools, okay? Agile is about a mindset, okay? It's about evolving, it's about changing, it's about adapting. First is the Agile mindset, then it's a series of tools. And I wasn't Agile enough. That was my problem, you know. Once I realized that I, that I can change, put the burden on other people, that's when it started changing. I've also seen it in business. I've replicated this model in business and I've seen it, seen it happen in business. I've seen it in teams, in business. I don't think this is just reduced to sport. This really happens in business. I'm just using this because it's a very easy way to show you because this really happened. In business, it's a lot more difficult. I've seen this exactly the same thing happen in business. A team at the beginning when it's formed usually needs a stronger leader, but then, it starts, once it's learned the culture, once, it's, once it's, it knows what it's doing, then you can back away and let it do things. Very rarely can you put together an Agile team and it starts working on its own. It needs to, unless it's, you've put together that Agile team from many people that have worked in the Agile environment, then, then, then it's, it's relatively easy. But if anybody hasn't been in that environment, they need to be taught that. And it's usually the Scrum Master that needs to massage it together, work it together, be, um, almost a team leader initially before they can back off because the team has learned to take responsibility and take ownership in delivery. That's the most difficult thing, taking ownership, okay? Um, I had this conversation even last month at my, at my current company. Somebody, I said, you need to take ownership. And somebody said, but what does that mean? And it suddenly hit me, yeah, this, this person was never, nobody really explained what it means ownership and how do they go about taking ownership of this project, okay? Any other questions? Awesome, thank you very much. I love it when we talk more. <laughs> um, a very quick request. I love the fact that not many of you are on the phones. That's a huge success for me. If you could take out your phones now, and this is, direct, this is my survey, my own personal one. I know there is one that, that the, the conference does. If you could just uh, quickly um, use the QR code Four questions on the, on the Likert scale, so it will take you 20 seconds to, uh, to fill in. I'd really appreciate some, some honest feedback about, about what, you, what you thought about this um, uh, so that I can, I can keep improving. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll see you at the games. All right? We, we're, playing, um, uh, we're playing next weekend in Katowice, so you'll be able to see it, see it live. Check out our Facebook, Kharkov Kings. Um, we're basically playing throughout the year because we have a senior team, we have a B team, we have a junior team. Now I'm, I'm uh, head coaching the junior team now, so that's great fun i get to work with kids so it's it's so much fun so yeah next next sunday uh you get to you get to see us see us play it will probably be online so 
you'll see me hanging out on the sideline. All right, brilliant. Thank you very much for your time and have a great weekend.